One of the things I think a lot of people need to understand is we aren't a museum piece. The Inupiaq people are a living people and a living culture. Even though we're in northern Alaska, which covers this vast area from Nome all the way over the Canadian border, is that there is this extreme value of interconnectedness and interdependence. It's a hunting society, a gathering society, from thousands of years. This is what creates our culture. That special relationship between humans and the natural world and the animals, and that it teaches you how to have a, a society that doesn't do too much harm to the world. Love and respect for nature, for one another, for our elders, very, very fundamental value, key to, key to life. Our values are something that bind us all. The importance of sharing with one another, the importance of spirituality, and the connection to the land, our traditions, how we hunt, sharing of stories and songs and dances. I'm Inupiaq. I'm from the Arctic Ocean. Inupiaq Maruma. I am Inupiaq. It's very important to me. It's, it's who I am as a person. And we're very proud of who we are and we want to continue that. It'd be busy, busy, busy all through the day. You get up and you just go right to work, you know? Right to work. There's always something to do. There's never any idle time. The only idle time we had was after we eat and before we go to bed. One of the older people would just be just relaxing, laying down there and saying, you know, it'd be really nice to hear a story. And then just organically, someone would just start telling the story. Storytelling for the Nupiak people is very important because it not only created that sense of community, but is a way to pass on wisdom to the next generation. It was like TV, you know? <laughs> it was just like, it was as good as anything, you, any movie you've ever seen. And the storyteller told it so clearly that it was just as powerful as any of the greatest movie blockbusters you've ever seen. There was a reason behind the stories that we were told because they held traditional knowledge. They held things that we might need to know in life, whether it was about how to find food or how to survive, or it was about well-being and the importance of connecting with people and being a good member of the community. We all do stories. We all live in stories. We all tell stories to our friends and, and they need to be told. They need to be heard. Unipkaotiaxi <laughs> Y 
So scrimshaw is this really beautiful method of art that's done either on baleen or ivory. And traditionally, it was used to tell stories. Each etching is telling a story of some event. Uh, caribou hunting was taking place. This is what was going on. War began around this time. And so it sort of gives you a timeline of history through etching. An elder or the person who carved it would literally be able to read the scrimshaw story. They're like reading a book, in a way. A lot of the storytelling traditions would be things that after the storytelling was done, we'd just rely on the next person telling it. And so scrimshaw is a very important way for Alaskan Native people to record their history.
When I was growing up, uh, my grandpa uh, had a pet white fox. If you're a good friend with a fox, when there's danger abound, they try to keep you from getting into trouble. They pull tricks here and there, and foxes are uh, like uh, spoiled little kids in that way. When you let her out, she'd go prancing out in the snow, jumping in the air. I know she was happy then. <laughs> Come running at me and jump on my chest, knock me backwards, lick my face, and, and I try not to let her. So that was my memory of my grandpa's pet fox. Garibu was, it, it provided for us in many ways. Our clothing in those days was made of all caribou skin. I grew up wearing caribou pants, mittens, caribou skin mattress, blankets. Some people had boots that were made with wolf leggings, sealskin sole bottoms. Baleen was shaved to make insoles. They kept us quite dry and warm as well. But the caribou skin clothing was the best. We would get as many yearlings as we could for our outer clothing. And for a heavy winter, we would get caribou in February or March because the hair was the longest and the skin was the thickest, and we would use those for our winter gear. With that stuff on, you could sleep outside in 50 below and it wouldn't bother you a bit. Silla is the weather. 
it also means the atmosphere. Here's the Nuna, or the land, and it's anything from the land into the moon, the sun, the stars. That's Sila. It's, uh, it's a very spiritual, and we have a relationship with Sila. Uh, Sila has a soul in the same way we do as people, in the same way animals do. I think spirit helpers in and of themselves are really about how we're connected with things. And so it may be that there is a spirit helper that shows themselves as a bird to show you the way home. Or it may be a spirit helper that actually decides to show themselves with the face and body of a man instead of their animal form. And so I think one of the things that's hard to understand is that it's not one way of seeing things. It's one way of knowing you're connected to everything. We've always had that spirituality of everything around us. It's the interaction you have with the air you breathe, the, the ocean that you gather resources from, the rivers from which you gather fish, the tundra from which you pick berries, the animals that give themselves. It's, it's all, of, all of that. In the winter, when we were traveling, we didn't build sod houses, we built snow houses. In Canada, they call them igloo, but here in Alaska, we call them apuya. We do a day of travel, and then we'd make an apuya. The next day, my father would set traps, spend the day there, rest the dogs, give them something to eat, and then the following day, we continue to the next place. 
would go to my dad's sister, who had a house at the bottom. They had a small sod house over there. We didn't have to do anything. We just visit with them, and my dad and my sister were glad to see each other, and they'd talk away while us kids played outside or go to sleep. By the time we get back to our home, my father would leave us with our aunt or with my grandmother. And then he'd start on his trips and go check his trap line. We were not into 8 to 5 kind of time, you know. We're in a totally different kind. We're in ecological time. <laughs> 